Hello, everyone. Um, if you are in the United States, this is the second session today of the 2023 Global Health Leaders Conference at Johns Hopkins. Um, my name is Daryl Fan. I'm the Director of Programming at GHLC. Today is July 23rd in Baltimore, Maryland, and we are honored to feature Dr. Yijun Luo. Um, Dr. Yijun Philip Luo is a distinguished physician with expertise in infectious diseases currently serving as the Deputy Director General of the Taiwan CDC. In addition, he holds an adjunct position as an infectious disease physician at the prestigious National Taiwan University Hospital. Dr. Luo earned his MD degree in 2001 from the National Taiwan University College of Medicine. In 2008, he made a pivotal decision to shift his career path from clinical medicine to public health. His dedication to combating infectious disease led him to pursue an Epidemic Intelligence Service Fellowship at the U.S. CDC, which he completed in 2011. Since then, Dr. Luo has been at the forefront of controlling various epidemics, including HIV, and has played instrumental roles in leading field investigation. He, was, he has also demonstrated his expertise in responding to emerging threats like H7N9, Ebola, MERS, and most notably COVID-19 in Taiwan. Amidst the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, Dr. Luo is currently serving as the Deputy Director of the Healthcare Response Team in the COVID-19 Central Epidemic Command Center in Taiwan, contributing significantly to the country's successful efforts in managing the outbreak. Dr. Luo, we're so glad to have you in our program today. Welcome to the Global Health Leaders Conference at Johns Hopkins. Um, please take it away. Thank you. Thank you much, uh, very much, Daryl. Hi, everybody. Uh, it's an honor for me to be invited to this Global Health Leadership Conference. Uh, and I'm humble. And I should say, I don't consider myself as a global health leader yet, but as a local uh, health I mean, regional health, I mean, I, I have tremendous experiences in combating a lot of uh, infectious diseases outbreaks uh, in the country and also within the region. So uh, I'm hopeful that you and your colleagues and your students will be able to share your feedback and uh, critiques after my like 30 minute presentation and uh, give me some, uh, some inspiration as well. Let me share my PowerPoint slide. Okay. Uh, so when, when we talk about Taiwan, I consider that our COVID experiences illustrate two very important lessons uh, over the past three years. Number one, we represent one of the West Pacific regional countries that using uh, the suppressive suppression approach to successfully uh, reduce or minimize the impact in terms of health uh, severity and also mortality of COVID-19, especially within the first two years. So I'll share some of our regional experiences in terms of uh, the West Pacific region. Also, uh, our experiences illustrate how we learn from mistakes made back 20 years ago when we were dealing with SARS, but we learn from our mistakes and uh, uh, evolve that uh, experiences to uh, relatively successful uh, response, especially in the early phase uh, when we deal with COVID-19 uh, first discovered uh, from China. So I'll focus on these two areas uh, in my presentation. Uh, about myself, uh, I'm 45 years old. Uh, I'm raised and mostly trained in Taiwan, so I'm not a native speaker of English. Uh, and uh, uh, I graduated from National Taiwan University and volunteered in a medical mission of Taiwan to Malawi. That was uh, that paved the, the, the way for me to join public health and also infectious disease uh, fellowship. So later on, after the volunteering, I, I was trained in our university hospital for internal medicine and also infectious diseases. After finishing my clinical training, I was about to uh, go back to Malawi to continue my service but unfortunately, Malawi broke the diplomatic relationship with Taiwan in 2008. So instead, I was invited to join Taiwan CDC as one of the earlier uh, medical officers. 
And uh, for the past like 15 years, I work at Taiwan CDC, but also had the opportunity to uh, to join US CDC for a special program called Epidemic Intelligence Service. Uh, it's also nicknamed as the Medical Detective Program. So if you are interested, you are most welcome to like, contact CDC or EIS alumni for this uh, very interesting and important program. After that uh, training program, I I, I was uh, go, I, I went back to Taiwan CDC uh, as a medical officer, then was promoted to the current position as Deputy Director General. But also within the two year of US CDC training, I also had a special opportunity to travel to Nigeria to join the CDC's uh, lead poisoning outbreak investigation there in northern uh, Nigeria. So those were uh, some of my international experiences that also helped me to know more about how to shift from clinical medicine to public health in a smoother way. Uh, as for the three years of COVID-19 response, uh, my participation started uh, on day one, which was 2019, December 31st. Uh, I was already a deputy director general of Taiwan CDC. And uh, uh, on that day, because uh, of a so uh, I mean, social media um, unofficial signal showing that there could be a mysterious outbreak involving hospital and also seafood market in Wuhan. And that was a Mandarin Chinese uh, signal on our uh, largest uh, web chat forum uh, called PTT. So I was uh, among the first one to detect that uh, soft signal uh, in the government and then pass on that signal to uh, my boss and also our prime minister's office. So on that day, we decided that it could be a very important and uh, serious threat. We decided to launch all the uh, necessary COVID-19, uh, I mean, the pandemic or disease control response since that day on. And on that day, uh, my boss and me and my colleague, uh, we also had a press conference uh, nationally to announced that uh, uh, it's a threat and we are doing something to prepare for that. And since that day one, until we finally uh, officially announced that the COVID-19 response is over, it's already more than uh, 1,200 days. And uh, on that uh, last year, this year, I was uh, serving as a spokesperson of the our command center and also I was uh, sitting on the final national COVID-19 press briefing on April 27th. But throughout the three years, I served as uh, many different roles. Uh, I was a face mask uh, and uh, personal protective equipment PPE management officer. And uh, most of the time, I was also the uh, healthcare and long-term care facility response officer. Of course, I, I also uh, take care of intersectional coordination and also because of the spokesperson role, I, I was involving a lot uh, with those public and the risk communication as well. So uh, after the presentation, if you have any questions regarding these aspects, you are also welcome to ask. Uh, looking back on the COVID-19 response globally, well, there is a very critic, critical review uh, on the prestigious a journal called Lancet. Uh, there is a Lancet commission on lessons for the, in the future from the COVID-19 pandemic. And the conclusion of that commission was COVID-19 response globally was a massive failure because a lot of uh, levels worldwide uh, failure led to millions of preventable deaths and also reversible reversal of in progress towards uh, SDGs in a lot of countries. And the aspects of failure, including prevention, rationality, transparency, uh, to follow normal public health practice, to, uh, to do operational cooperation, and also international solidarity. And in terms of government's responsibility, uh, most of the countries uh, were not able to be well prepared, and also were too slow, and also paid too little attention to the uh, vulnerable population. And also uh, the, uh, the consequences were low public trust and uh, also a surge of misinformation worldwide. 
But in that uh, important article, uh, West Pacific region was specifically pointed out as somehow relatively successful or better in terms of uh, maintaining relatively low death rates. So the countries that were listed included Australia, China, New Zealand, uh, Republic of Korea, and also Taiwan. And the, the region generally adopted suppression strategies. And uh, uh, when, when, when we still don't have the vaccine, and when we started to have the vaccine, also we launched big national vaccination campaign. And after making sure that vaccination coverage is good enough, then uh, a lot of the countries shifted to living with the virus, especially because of emergence of the, the less virulent uh, Omicron variant. Uh, so the, the key words of those uh, countries in the West Pacific regions during the early phase was uh, they used tools and uh, also a lot of manpower to do contact tracing, to do testing, to ensure quarantine and isolation are well implemented. When we say quarantine, uh, we talk about those who are not yet ill. When we say isolation, it only refers to those who are already COVID-19 laboratory confirmed. Although they are always uh, like interchangeable in some scenario, but in this presentation, most of the public health presentation, we specifically want to separate quarantine versus isolation to have different meaning. So here you can see from this graph that uh, throughout the almost three years, the blue line indicate the, uh, the death numbers and the different color uh, illustrates uh, the number of cases uh, in different regions. So uh, like for example, in America, it's uh, it's, the color is yellow, and you can see uh, from this graph that uh, actually uh, all of the regions in the, com in, in the world, they experienced the largest number of cases after Omicron emerged. But for the death number, the death number were already high uh, before Omicron emerged. Actually, in 2021, most of the countries in the world have already experienced their the most serious waves of mortality and the severity of COVID-19. But because of suppression approach in Western Pacific countries, which are uh, illustrated in the red, purple red color, we are, um, we are the last region in the world to, uh, uh, to shift to living with COVID and actually largely avoided excess death in the first two years. So even after we started to experience a large number of cases because of Omicron and living with the virus, we still see relatively low number of death numbers uh, on a daily basis compared to the rest of the world. And the reason that we were able to avoid those bad consequences was, uh, well, you can see from the left-hand side, it's the, the map showing the global vaccination rate. And uh, the two, two red circles indicate the West Pacific regions from Japan, Korea, China, Taiwan to uh, New Zealand and Australia. We are relatively among the, the higher vaccination coverage rate uh, compared to the rest of the world. And on the right hand side, you'll see uh, also West Pacific region uh, has the lowest cumulated deaths from COVID compared to other regions of the, the, the world. So most of the time, uh, if there is a global comparison, uh, the presenters may choose West Pacific region or one of the West Pacific countries to uh, showcase that, uh, well, COVID-19 can be controlled to this kind of scale. And usually we summarize that as a suppression approach. And uh, uh, economies or countries that follows uh, suppression approach included China, New Zealand, Taiwan, and Korea. We generally had a smaller growth shortfall in terms of economics than the rest of the world. And in a few cases such as Taiwan, actual GDP uh, was higher than predicted, even because even through, uh, throughout the first two years of COVID-19 pandemic. And uh, the, the good results shows that uh, the governance of Taiwan's COVID-19 pandemic response 
may have something that can be shared uh, with the rest of the, the world. So uh, here I, I, I want to show you another international report. It was made by the International Center for Non-for-Profit Law uh, based in Washington, D.C. And the whole report is, uh, the full report is available online. It just published earlier this year in March 2023. They, they try to look at Taiwan's experience looking at, from a human rights perspective. So our result, public health is a low case number and the lower death counts. So we were able to avoid stringent measures such as uh, lockdowns and school and workplace closings for much of the pandemic. On the right hand side, you can see our uh, stringency index, the higher, the stricter. And for Taiwan, we only have 70 days of um, stricter, stricter uh, measures that were not yet locked down. Our state street restriction, people were still allowed to go to work, but most of the schools were closed and uh, changed to remote uh, teaching. And also the public transportation were still widely available. People can still commute, people can still travel within the country. Uh, we ask everybody to wear a mask when they go out of their home. Uh, but, uh, and they, 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 well, we also didn't uh, allow people to dine in in a restaurant, but uh, take out and uh, uh, vendors on the streets are still allowed. So we don't have any hard lockdown throughout the pandemic at all. Compared to uh, US, they actually have um, stricter measures for almost one in the 1.5 years. So uh, Taiwan is among the countries in the world that has a low stringency index. And um, uh, unlike a lot of the countries, because of our previously uh, legal authorization due to SARS legacy 2003, uh, we were careful not to impose a state of emergency by using the current legal infrastructure to implement a lot of those uh, uh, stringent uh, measures. And also some of the reports uh, highlights were uh, that the pandemic generally concentrated greater executive powers in governments worldwide, leading to widespread infringements of civil liberties, but uh, that was not the case in Taiwan. So uh, some of the good practices that may contribute to uh, response success in Taiwan included uh, the use of daily press conferences and also social media channels, which I'll give you more information uh, later on. Uh, and also the work between central and the local government and uh, their coordination with the private sector and the civil society, especially in terms of uh, massive production of face masks and also setting up those quarantine services uh, are good examples of how we coordinate with local and the private sector, which I'll give you more information as well later on. And also we use a lot of those digital technology, digital tools to help uh, like locate where you can get a mask and also uh, to help uh, contact tracing and also quarantine services. And also we work with fact-checking organizations in order to counter a lot of those information uh, during the pandemic. Local governments were also very, very important. Uh, they work together with uh, civil groups that are providing services to the homeless and also vulnerable population affected by the pandemic. So uh, if you think Taiwan has a little bit success of the COVID-19 response, uh, I will actually attribute uh, the success to our SARS legacy. Uh, in this ICNL report, the con one of the conclusions is Taiwan's whole of nation approach was built on lessons learned in managing previous disease outbreaks such as SARS in 2003. Uh, SARS stands for Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome. It's uh, another coronavirus and that caused a uh, original outbreak in 2003, mainly in East Asia, but uh, also involving Canada as well because of the travel. Uh, and on the right hand side, you can see SARS one was on the front page of the magazine Time uh, during 2003 in May. And, and that also starts the 
uh, discussion of my presentation on what happened during 2003 when we were dealing with SARS, what, what kind of failure we were experiencing. So looking back uh, in 2003, 20 years ago, uh, you can see some very uh, miserable pictures here. Those were the newspaper headlines. Um, you see some sad faces. On the left hand side, you see sad faces of those healthcare workers that were forced to be quarantined in this hospital uh, during lockdown. And on the right hand side, you see a face of uh, a metro that works in that hospital, Metro Chen. Uh, she was the first Taiwanese healthcare worker that died of SARS because of taking care of patients. During that time, a hospital in Taipei City uh, was locked down because of delayed notification and of SARS. More than 1,000 patients and workers were forced to be quarantined inside this hospital with no clear communication and no clear distinction between safe zones and dirty zones. Therefore, hospital transmission continued. In total, 150 persons were infected. 35 of them unfortunately passed away. And this newspaper headline shows that the first sacrifice healthcare worker because of SARS, she and a younger physician in the same hospital were infected by a patient and both unfortunately died of SARS despite uh, intensive care. This tragic story and the large number of deaths have traumatized every single person in Taiwan, even until now. And the, the memory still lasts this year because it's the 20th anniversary of that SARS outbreak. In Taiwan, if you have a chance to be here uh, during April and, uh, and the May, you will see two movies in our local cinema. On the left hand side is actually an online movie. Uh, it's called The Island Nation Hoping. And Hoping is that uh, hospital's name, the, the hospital that went into lockdown in 2003. On the right hand side, you can see uh, it's a movie in the cinema showing the story during that time of the hospital lockdown. And uh, those two local movies show that people in Taiwan are still mem uh, still remembering uh, what happened in SARS and they want to learn from the mistakes and take that lessons learned uh, into future uh, coping uh, with infectious diseases. So what really happened? Going back to the beginning uh, in 2002, actually in late 2002, November, uh, the SARS outbreak started in southern China and it was not yet well known for what kind of pathogen it was. So they named it a typical pneumonia outbreak. But it took actually several months from November to February, uh, almost four months be uh, before China reported to the WHO. And WHO finally issued a global alert in March 2003. But during that time before WHO issued the global alert, we already see some of those SARS importation into Taiwan, uh, reaching our borders. Fortunately, those imported cases, uh, which illustrate the first wave of SARS, uh, was brought into control and didn't lead to local spread. So what happened after that initial success was complacency. The complacency occurred when, well, Taiwan is very, uh, was very uh, good at controlling infectious diseases. So there was a complacency about uh, we had to have zero SARS case, zero SARS deaths, and the, the success of Taiwan's controlling SARS story had to be told uh, day in the day. And because SARS became a success story to tell and the story cannot fail, uh, the government wastes precious time advertising uh, achievement but not filling gaps in border control, surveillance reporting, and also hospital preparedness. In the end, underreported cases increased in numbers and the large hospital outbreaks, such as what you saw in the previous slides, became real uh, after mid-April. When the outbreak was finally over because of large, massive quarantine, um, 
a total of 346 confirmed cases, including 70 deaths were rec recorded. And 11 of, of those deaths occurring uh, among healthcare workers became a uh, traumatized uh, story of Taiwan. Massive quarantine became the key to uh, control the uh, outbreak. However, the society already paid a heavy price to learn from this tremendous SARS outbreak. The price became public trust. There was a major crisis of public trust in terms of face mask supply, quarantine management, healthcare and laboratory capacity, and also media handling was dysfunctional as well. Um, inadequate uh, government effort coordination and also there was a high degree stigma towards patients and the frontline workers as well. So uh, we learned from those painful lessons in Taiwan. Uh, after the outbreak, strong political commitment was made, uh, not only to the ruling party, but also to the, to the opposition party as well. It's a whole society lesson. Uh, infrastructure must be reform and be ready uh, before the next SARS-like outbreak comes to haunt us. Uh, we set up information system to capture official and unofficial epidemic intelligence as quickly and early as possible. Uh, we also revised the law to enable a strong and centralized command system in the case of public health emergency. Resources were mobilized to establish a healthcare network that is able and ready to isolate and care highly contagious patients with workers in full protection and compensation. And more importantly, uh, making sure that clear, transparent communication is happening on a day-to-day -day practices. So when emergency comes, the spokesperson system is ready and the media already knew credible and the familiar source. And an important and also a good example is our healthcare reform after SARS, uh, especially in terms of legal and the financial infrastructure. By the revised Communicable Disease Act, all hospitals in Taiwan, not only public, but also private, they must hire infectious control uh, specialists, including doctors and nurses, and their income is secured. And for preparedness and response efforts, Taiwan CDC may designate any hospital for isolation and the treatment. And in return, the government covers its training, allowance, reimbursement, and compensation for revenue loss. Taiwan CDC is also fully responsible to cover costs for isolation and the care of those patients. Patients do not need to worry about hospital bills at all. And to protect patients' privacy, the law also required uh, media respect, confidentiality, and not to disclose personal identity of patients. This law turned out to be very, very useful when, uh, when we were dealing with COVID-19. In terms of that media law, also it helped us to uh, ensure that patient confidentiality can be well protected. So a little bit about what happened in the early phase of our COVID-19 response. On that so-called day one, December 31st, uh, 2019, in the very, very early morning, uh, there was a, a post in our largest web chat forum called PTT uh, at 2.24 p.m. Uh, a.m. Uh, it was written in Mandarin Chinese. Uh, but you can see from those uh, script, uh, there is indicator of SARS or SARS-like virus occurring in Wuhan. And uh, we pick out those keywords and find out more when the more posts were actually circulating uh, in the web, uh, web or uh, in the web, web micro blocks in China. And uh, later on, we recognize that it could be a very important signal. And we immediately send some uh, confirmation signal to our counterparts in Beijing. But they only reply like uh, six hours later using a press release saying that it's not SARS and uh, they are still investigating.
but already we knew that from the beginning of SARS 2003, there could be some information hiding or uh, untransparent uh, information as well. So we decided to start immediate response on that day one. On this graph, you can see uh, on the left hand side, because of the early morning intelligence on that day one, uh, in the afternoon, we began onboard health exam for all flight passengers coming directly from Wuhan. And since that, all the sequences started. Uh, we started rapid response task force, and also we established reporting criteria. And after China announced it's a new coronavirus, uh, we set up our laboratory diagnosis protocol. And we also sent two experts uh, in mid-January to personally visit Wuhan. And during their interviews with the officials over there, they confirmed there has been already human-to-human -human transmission happening uh, in some of these families. But the, 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 uh, the evolution was actually very quick. Uh, after that visit, uh, very quickly, the first uh, case outside China was detected in Thailand, later on in Japan, and then in Korea. We detect our first imported case on 21st of January, but one day before that, because of the escalation of uh, importation out elsewhere in Asia, we already decided to uh, list COVID-19 as a national notifiable disease and also launch our command center and the daily press conference. And uh, soon after that, uh, Wuhan announced lockdown and we knew that while well, there was really information hiding in Wuhan and we were happy that we already were guessing in a correct direction. But WHO was acting relatively slow, not until the end of January, the WHO finally decided to declare COVID-19 as a public health emergency of international concern. When we already start a lot of these measures, including border control and also ban of visitors from China to try to reduce the impact. So in the early phase, although we were so uh, close in proximity to China, we were not like South Korea or Japan to have a large community spread uh, during the early phase. And during that time, there was a massive mask shortage because of panic buying, not only because of the Chinese tourists buying, but also the local people were also stockpiling masks for their personal use. So uh, already before the pandemic, because of the 20 years preparedness, we have large stockpile nationally for the face mask. So we immediately released those stockpiles and for our citizens to pick up from pharmacies or convenience stores. But the stockpile was still not enough. So we evolved that into massive production in February and, uh, and mobilized private sectors and factories uh, and also our uh, national defense soldiers to participate in this face mass massive production. In the end, we were using a digital health insurance card and also a map uh, to helping uh, our citizens to locate where they can support. And the government distributed face masks were sold in a very cheap price, but they were sold in a fixed number. So you cannot buy too many because everybody is entitled to get a few uh, every two weeks. And also, uh, it's free of charge to healthcare facilities and healthcare workers as well. Other than the face mask supply, also an uh, important strategy, or maybe the most important strategy of our COVID-19 control in the early phase was the 14-day mandatory quarantine. And how to make sure that in a way uh, is key. For all the travelers coming into Taiwan, they have to fill in this quarantine system before entry. And the, the, the important information recorded there is their personal information and also their address, whether it's a home or a hotel or their residence after arrival, and their phone number as well. 
And those, not, those key information were immediately linked to our civil services and also health services. The civil services will take care of their day-to-day -day, uh, life uh, during the 14-day quarantine. And health services will make sure any illness during that 14 day will be well taken care of. So after logging into those systems and arrival uh, in the airport, we ask all the passengers to uh, uh, to have a client based smartphone app for a two way interaction uh, for any fever or symptom reporting during the following 14 days. And the cell phone number is also passed on to the police system. So the cell phone will be the GPS signal for uh, locating where that passenger is. And if, if the passenger is out or still within the uh, designated area that they should stay for the 14 days. If they are out of the range of that current place, uh, the police link digital tracking will uh, be immediately launched and police will uh, chase down to see where the passenger or the, the person who is in quarantine is. And there is a heavy punishment associated with in, intrusion, a, a violation of that uh, quarantine measures. Also for healthcare response, uh, it was a big surge up during COVID-19. We already set up 22 primary response hospitals after SARS. So each county and the city, they have a primary response hospital to take care of highly contagious patients. They were also supported by more than 100 secondary response hospitals countrywide. And we already had almost 1,000 negative pressure rooms uh, to accommodate those highly contagious patients. But obviously for COVID-19, it's not enough. So a lot of the capacity were further mobilized in 2020 and also later on in 2021. So those also illustrates our uh, stage-wise uh, different escalation of our capacity uh, in different phases of the COVID-19 response. A very important, especially for the public uh, area is uh, the daily press conference. Uh, from day one of that command center in late January, our commander was sitting on that press conference almost on a daily basis at 2 p.m. and it's live stream. So a lot of the people in Taiwan, they were anxiously waiting every day in the uh, afternoon to see whether the new COVID-19 situation is. And most of the time the commander is uh, joined by a vice commander and also a professor, CDC director and a spokesperson. Our commander or the Minister of Health is a dentist by his, uh, himself uh, background. Uh, our vice commander is the deputy minister of internal affairs. And the professor is an infectious disease professor of University Hospital. Our CDC director general is a dentist. Our spokesperson is a medical doctor. So a lot of these people sitting on the press conference had medical background and they can answer not only questions about policy, but they can, they can also do public education and answer questions that are related to research or medicine as well. And during that time, uh, every day, the commander gives an update on new cases, investigation results, policy, and also answer media's question until no question is raised. Most of the time, the conference will last about one hour. And sometimes if questions are many, uh, they they, they keep to be live streamed until uh, one hour and 30 minutes as well. And because of that, uh, Commander quickly became very, very familiar uh, to all the people in Taiwan and becomes a highly recognizable icon uh, by uh, the public. So on the left hand side, you can see a lot of those comics or icons that were made uh, to associate uh, the fight of COVID uh, with our commander. And during that time, especially during the first year, high level public trust is shown by a survey showing that 95% uh, of the businesses in Taiwan were satisfied with government's efforts uh, to control the virus. Well, but the good story didn't last, I mean, forever. 
because the emergence of Omicron and the long lasting uh, control measures, people still people were starting to feel fatigue and people want to open up. So in May 2022, the government in Taiwan decided to change policy from COVID nine from zero COVID to living with the virus. And this is the report on the Guardian, the newspaper Guardian, uh, and the the the, uh, the title is called "Once the Zero COVID Poster Child: Taiwan Learns to Live with the Virus." And uh, there were uh, hiccups and pain after changing the the policy because people are so used to very little number of COVID cases in Taiwan. We even had a 256 days of zero COVID. Uh, record continuously zero COVID. So when we suddenly started to have thousands or more than 100,000 of cases on a daily basis or weekly basis, people started to feel anxious and nervous. And uh, the, the change also didn't happen in a very smooth way. The government didn't plan to, uh, to in advance for the procedures and the preparedness to live with the, the Omicron tsunami. So we were blamed for more reactive than proactive. And a lot of people, uh, they were also complaining about policy and the regulation change almost daily and incrementally because we didn't want to lose up all the restrictions uh, just in one day. So like shortening the quarantine days from 14 to 10 days, then to seven days, then to five days. That's more like a gradual relaxation. But for those people who are not used to like gradual policy change, it could be confusing. And also it could be difficult for the local partners to implement when the policy keep changing on a like a weekly or bi-weekly basis. And so in May 2002, uh, uh, a polling uh, during that time found almost like 50 50 split of supporting or not supporting the living with COVID policy. But, but after that, anyway, so we got very much and it, uh, eventually shifted to uh, almost normal life uh, after May this year uh, and dismissed the command center. So I'll just give you a short conclusion that I think for the early response, we did pretty good. Uh, we learned a lot of lessons from SARS, including preparedness, legal, financial infrastructure, political commitment, and using innovative digital technology and also public trust. But uh, some of the painful lessons also were learned uh, throughout the three years of COVID-19. That is number one, public trust and cooperation, they cannot last long. It leads to people's fatigue and also misinformation circulation. And also a lot of people were complaining that uh, we were not living just for health, for good health or for public health. A lot of these COVID measures were still compromising economics and also uh, education or other aspects. So crosstalks and listening to different perspectives, I think will be the key for our post-pandemic preparedness uh, for a more sustainable and response in the future. So that's my uh, short presentation, and I, uh, I'm sending back the microphone to Daryl for any question that can be picked up from the audience. Thank you very much. All right, thank you so much, Dr. Luo, for the um, informative presentation. Um, so at this time, um, if any of you guys have any questions, um, please use the raise hand function in Microsoft Teams um, and I will call on your name. Um, when I call on your name, um, you can unmute and you can ask your questions. So the first person I see is Enrico Hernandez. So my question is that I noticed that at least in American political discourse, anti-science rhetoric has becoming uh, increasingly more rampant. How do you convince people that uh, scientific and health issues such as COVID-19, environmental issues, and global warming exist and to be taken seriously when they don't necessarily value science or deny its existence as a whole? Okay, uh, I expect that kind of question to be emerged. It's related to like a comparison between two countries and uh, how we can like translate our lessons to 
another country? I'll have to say it's very difficult to do that. You can see the culture in East Asia, we are very habitual to wear a mask and we tend to like listen to professional and the government's recommendations more than probably the Western society. So that's like the foundation or basis of those uh, issues. Still, I think in terms of other like environmental or global health, global warming issues, it's not yet that kind of high level in Taiwan yet in the, in the society. But in terms of disease circulating or like SARS or infectious disease, because of that SARS uh, tra traumatization in 2003, a lot of people were still vividly remembering what happened during that time. And they don't want to repeat the same mistakes. So I think people learn from mistakes. That's why my title is No Pen, No Gain. And I think uh, because of the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, the global population or the global society has a good chance to drive that uh, momentum to like creating a better preparedness structure and a reform for the next highly contagious infectious disease. But that does not necessarily translate to other important global health issues. People are just um, tentative, attentive to the, the most impressive or the most uh, immediate uh, experiences they had. So we cannot just think, well, it, it's very easy to translate that to other aspects. And how do I, how do we convince our people? I don't think it's our, we convince the people. It's actually the, the previous history or the previous experiences that already convinced the people. We're just recalling or reminding people that, okay, what happened during that time should not be repeated here. And our healthcare community was especially very uh, vigilant and also resilient in terms of educating their patients and uh, their colleagues that the same mistakes in SARS cannot be repeated. So uh, it's not really the government's effort, I think, in terms of convincing people. We tried our best, but some, most of the time, especially during an election year, it's very difficult to convince people of all different uh, backgrounds. Uh, so that was also the case 2022, last year, when we uh, decided to change our policy to living with COVID, but it happened to be an election year in Taiwan. So the, the convincing became very, very difficult and was also manipulated by uh, some of the politicians. Next one, Arken Singhao. Um, sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name. Uh, so there's another disease called uh, monkeypox that, while it is not as, as big as COVID, the WHO has declared it a global health emergency. How do you believe if if the disease does become big, and with Taiwan's experience, how do you believe we should r rise to the occasion if it were to become another global pandemic? So uh, the global health governance is, um, I mean, is poor uh, of the COVID. Uh, pandemic. I mean, people people blame the governments for acting too slow and also like not very attentive to disease threats and the population. And I hope most of the government in the, in the world can learn. For us, uh, we are revising our laws and also our regulations to try to shape a more sustainable and also uh, inclusive uh, public health infrastructure in order to encounter uh, the future crisis. But in terms of the region, I think a lot of the countries in the region, uh, the, the West Pacific region, uh, are thinking of setting up a CDC-like agency. Like for example, Japan, they didn't have a CDC. Although you have a CDC in the United States, it doesn't mean every single country in the world has a CDC. We have a CDC in Taiwan in 2000 uh, because we also had a big childhood uh, enterovirus outbreak back in the uh, 1998 that helped reform the structure from a very separate uh, and uh, isolated uh, disease preventing network into a cooperative and uh, uh, unity agency. Uh, Japan was also like that and so Japan is thinking of setting up a CDC to integrate services and also control agency and authority together and research. Australia is also thinking of setting up a CDC. Singapore is also setting up a CDC. So uh, aspect is how this country will act based on their previous lessons 
to more integrate and also invest in public health in terms of combating those infectious diseases. Uh, for WHO, they are working on establishing a newer uh, treaty, global treaty to combat the pandemics, but a lot of the countries were still in disagreement. And uh, also there is another platform that is trying to be created for collecting pathogens internationally for uh, public health in, in significant, uh, for public health significance, but still a lot of countries were in dis uh, disagreement because uh, collecting pathogens may be useful for detection and also research purpose, but also in terms of commercial or, or manufacturer's point of view, these pathogens could be a very good like property of that researcher or the, the, the vaccine company. Uh, so how to break up these um, uh, barriers and like people try to be more cooperative and uh, in unity, solidarity will be an important lesson, but difficult to, to get a consensus, I think, based on the global health uh, atmosphere at this time, especially because of Ukraine or Russia, China, people are thinking of their own interest at the, at the moment. So as a country and a region, we are trying our best to protect our own people, but how to do more like internationally or between countries and countries, this will have to be built by a more higher like global global health level, uh, I mean, uh, perseverance and also determination. And I haven't seen the, the role of the United States government yet <laughs> in terms of this effort. Maybe they are too busy with other things. Or the US CDC also is experiencing a lot of those criticism as well. So it's important for US CDC to stand back <laughs> to their own feet uh, in order to have bigger a bigger role uh, in the future. Last but not least, um, Alexander Yi. All right. Um, I'm actually glad I got to ask this, or I got to speak because, um, so first, thank you, Dr. Yi Chin, Chin Luo. Sorry, I wasn't here to hit the pronunciation, but um, I'd like to thank you for your presentation. But I also want to mention that um, my parents are Taiwanese immigrants, so I'd also like to thank the Taiwan CDC, you and your team, for having such a good response because practically all of my family lives in Taiwan and your response is able to keep them safe. So on to my question, um, uh, you said in the first question that um, uh, people will learn from the history like SARS, right? So from that, do you think, do you think the governments, um, other governments like the US government, will they learn from um, COVID-19 and do you think they should imitate policy or Taiwanese policy of COVID? And do you think they will? Uh, well, first of all, thank you for like commending me for protecting your family. That's my job. So I'm very honored and delighted to do so. And I think US will learn because uh, US CDC has a good history of learning from their uh, important or significant events. Remember, in early 2000, there was a 911 attack and also the, the botulism uh, attack as well. So those bioterrorist threat uh, were still lasting here, but uh, COVID-19 uh, is a natural occurring. Well, it, we don't know the origin yet, so I define that as a naturally occurring uh, bio threat. It's something new to publicly uh, the national security system uh, in terms of a long lasting and also uh, coronavirus was not in the radar for a, a lot of the, the government because we are only worrying about the pandemic influenza uh, like H1N1 or H7N9, something like that. So now coronavirus is on our, our radar and I think uh, USCDC has very, very good scientist panel. Uh, they will have a good plan to for the US to, to be very, very well prepared and also leading the world to, to the next phase of pandemic response. Uh, it's only a matter of whether the, the, the Congress or the, the White House, the leadership, they will accept the plan or not. So I have no doubt that uh, USCDC uh, is able to uh, to build out that plan for the country. But whether the, the, the two parties can work together and also agree to invest more in this public health uh, infrastructure, uh, well, it will will bring back the issue to whether the US people, they want to spend more money to protect 
people from getting infectious disease? And I think the, the answer will be yes. Uh, so it just take time and also um, discussion, negotiation in the political arena, whether uh, that kind of investment will be there sooner or better. And the, also the, another key question is how long that uh, investment can be sustained. The 911 and also botulism attack uh, maybe gave, giving US uh, public health authorities and also state health department, local health department, like a one decade, one, one 10 years of those uh, continuous investment into their manpower and also uh, resources, laboratory, public health network, and health system reform. But after that, that money was gone. And, uh, and the people were trying the whole hard to get another financial uh, support uh, to continue those services. So I think the painful lesson people still have to learn is you invest something and uh, for a certain years of time, you think the threat is gone and you re remove the money, well, that threat is going to haunt you <laughs> again. So SARS and COVID is the right uh, signal that we should pick up. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Daryl. Have a good night. Bye-bye.